Dr. Al Mully graduated from Dartmouth in 1970, magna cum laude, and Phi Beta Kappa. He served on the Dartmouth Board of Trustees from 2004 to 2010 before assuming his post as director for the Dartmouth Center for Healthcare Delivery Science. Last, last November, he served as the chief of the General Medicine Division and director of Medical Practices Evaluation Center at Massachusetts General Hospital, and he also taught as an associate professor of medicine and health policy at Harvard Medical School. He wrote Primary Care Medicine. The first major text include Principles of Clinical Epidemiology, and he is also one of the founders of the Foundation for Informed Medical Decision Making. Over his long career at Mass General and Harvard, Dr. Mully emerged as an innovative leader in the science and application of shared decision making and other forms of collaboration between clinicians and patients. We are pleased and honored to have him back here with us at Dartmouth as the director of the health Center for Healthcare Delivery Sciences. His talk today is entitled, Who Can Fix Healthcare? Please help me welcome Al Mully. Thank you very much, Marianne, and, and thank you to all of you for um, coming out on a Saturday morning to uh, have a conversation about healthcare. Uh, let me tell you the story behind the story um, in the introduction there, because it's very much a Dartmouth story. Um, when I was an undergraduate here from 66 to 70, um, I was pre-med because I wasn't interested in the law. And uh, what I mean by that is I was a first generation kid and there didn't seem to be a lot of options for those of us who didn't know what higher education could lead to. Um, so I was a pre-med. Um, in my junior year, I was asked by um, uh, a biology faculty member if I would join a student faculty committee that consisted of three faculty, three students, and our objective was to create a new curriculum for what was the first um, university human biology course. I attended the first meeting, uh, just a five minute walk from here in uh, the faculty lounge at uh, Gilman. Um, it was January of 1969, and Bill Ballard, who was one of the three uh, faculty members, some of you may know these guys, it was Ray Barrett, Bill Ballard, and Ruth Chapman, who was wife of the dean of the medical school at the time. And um, Bill Ballard showed up with six copies of a paper that had been published uh, just the month before in the journal Science. And the paper was Garrett Hardin's Tragedy of the Commons. How many of you have heard of that? Fascinating metaphor about how markets can fail um, when everybody pursues their um, own interests and you're dealing with common pool resources. Simply put, the metaphor was about a commons um, that everybody had the right to put their sheep or cattle on to, to graze. So everybody at the margin had the incentive to put yet another um, sheep or cattle on the common to graze. And what happens to the common under those circumstances? It becomes overgrazed, all the sheep and all the cattle die unless they're alternative resources. And uh, remember, we were talking about human biology, so we were talking about common pool resource problems related to the life sciences and to biology. We had just passed Medicare a couple years before, uh, at the time, Richard Nixon was talking a lot about what it meant to be paying for health care with taxpayer dollars. Um, as a result, I became fascinated with the uh, problem of common pool resources in health care. And succinctly put, what I saw as a real challenge was how do you decide where to build capacity to deliver different kinds of health care? How do you decide how much to invest in primary care, secondary care, tertiary care? How do you decide to invest in mental health? pediatrics, geriatric care, surgical care, intensive care, um, and do that in ways that allow everybody, each individual, at the personal and individual level, to get the care they need no less and the care they want and no more. And sort of this great puzzle that we're struggling with yet to this day. And it isn't just the United States that's struggling with it. We're struggling with it most visibly because of what we spend on healthcare. But this is a common problem um, that raises havoc across the range of wealth of nations. Um, and since 2008, when everybody has been feeling enormous budget pressure, it's a problem that is very, very visible on radar screens across the world. So um, I decided then that I would um, only apply to medical schools where I could get a degree in economics. This was, a, this was as a junior in, in 1969, um, and not be viewed as subversive by the medical faculty. 
and that actually limited my choices quite a bit. <laughs> so I ended, up, uh, I ended up at Harvard and um, was very fortunate. I, I, uh, I, I left here in 1970. I was at Harvard for 40 years, as you heard, uh, 35 at the uh, MGH, uh, most of that time as uh, chief of the general medicine division. And it is a great um, privilege to be able to spend four years at Dartmouth, 40 years at Harvard, and then come back um, uh, to, uh, to Dartmouth and, and join the provost and the deans um, and the president in, in trying to bring Dartmouth's assets together to grapple with this problem that I became interested in um, as a junior just up the road here. So that's the story behind the story. And the, the reason I tell it is I, I will tell um, people all over the world, whoever will listen, that um, that kind of faculty attention and the opportunity that sprang from it um, for me um, really is one of the things that makes Dartmouth such a distinctive place. What I thought I would do today is, is um, do a reprise of a TEDx talk. How many of you um, know about TED Talks or have seen TED Talks? Okay. So I'm not going to repeat my TED talk. What I've decided would be much more fun would be to sort of bring you into the inside and give you a sense of what I was trying to accomplish in my TED talk and then have a conversation afterwards. For those of you who haven't seen a TED talk, they're very stylized. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of style here that I have to um, acknowledge uh, Dan Lee, my colleague, for helping me with. Otherwise, I would have been the least stylish TEDx talk um, on the Hanover plane that day. Um, and um, they're highly stylized, and because of that, there's a fair amount of pressure on presentation. And uh, that's a good thing, I guess. It forces you to think about what you want to say. Um, but you can all go online, and, and, and uh, it, it, it got a lot, it, it's had over a thousand viewings, and there were 500 people in the audience at the time. And I didn't think it would be useful to just repeat that. Um, so I'm going to take you through the slides and kind of narrate what it was that I was trying to accomplish. Occasionally, I'll slip into the stylized stuff. Um, but we can do that in 20 minutes or so. And then I thought I would take some questions and, you know, maybe not answer them all, but take them. And we'd, I, I don't have chalk up here, but I have pen and paper. And we'd um, uh, put together a list of issues. And then I could come back even with some more slides. I've got them in the, in the can if we need to use them and talk a little bit about the future and how the Center for Healthcare Delivery Science uh, is going to be trying to address and support, uh, address the question, who can fix healthcare, and support those who step up to do so. Okay, does that sound like a fair agenda? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, there I am, I climb up on the stage at, at um, Spalding, um, not knowing an awful lot about what's going to come out, and I get up there and I walk along the stage and I say, um, who can fix health care? Uh, some people think that doctors can fix health care. Trust me, I'm a doctor. We can't. <laughs> some people think that policymakers can fix health care. Um, whether it's somebody uh, passing legislation at the state level, whether it's somebody passing legislation at the federal level, um, even a president, I don't think so. The British tried to fix health care passing legislation in 1946, creating something called the NHS, the National Health Service, where care is free at the point of service and is paid for by taxpayers. We actually passed legislation at the same year in the United States, 1946. Wasn't nearly as radical in reaching out for security and equity. I personally think that has to do with the fact that though we were both engaged in a, in a great war, um, it was much more proximate for the British occupied territory 20 miles away, bombs raining on their capital, uh, many nights of the week, huddled in the underground. Uh, they were really looking for security, and they had a sense of solidarity, and a lot of that solidarity reflected around taking care of the injured, taking care of one another with regard to health care. We can come back and talk later about what we did. Uh, American presidents tried um, since Harry Truman, even before to create a similar kind of reach for health security and health equity in the United States, um, but virtually all have failed. When I gave this talk, it was right after um, the passage of health care reform in the United States, and I was able to say, we've taken a step, and we'll see how it turns out. We're still waiting to see how it turns out. So if not doctors, if not policymakers, who can fix health care? The response was you. 
okay? You, each of you. Now, and then I said, so this is an audience of about 700 people in Spalding, lots of students, faculty, maybe 50% students, 25% faculty, 25% people from the Upper Valley. So I thought I would, and maybe you're feeling this way, how can I fix healthcare? You know, that's a job for someone else. But I've just told you it's not the doctors and it's not the policymakers. Are you looking around at one another? Who, me? Her, him, maybe her or him, not me. And um, I wanted to make the point that across age ranges, across demographic ranges, across levels of health and well-being, um, healthcare won't get solved unless we pay a lot more attention to the kinds of decisions that are made that lead to the delivery of healthcare that produce consequences that individuals and communities live with. So think about your role in the decisions that you make on a day-to-day -day basis that determine your future in various ways. And think about the attention that you pay to decisions about your health care. That's a bit of a preface. Now, we spend uh, $2.5 trillion in health care in the United States. It's 17% of our gross domestic product. That's more than 50% higher than other um, OECD countries, 50% um, uh, higher than any of the European countries. Um, you know, there maybe 11, 12% is where it tops out. Um, the UK, um, a few years ago, as recently as six years ago, spent 6.7% of their GDP. Uh, they made a political commitment to bring that spending up to closer to the rate of the rest of Europe and went from 6.7% to about 9.5%. Um, interesting question as to what they achieved in doing so. And despite this kind of spending, we don't do terribly well when you look at overall measures of healthcare. In fact, in the World Health Organization ranking for healthcare system performance, we rank 37th. You look at infant mortality, you look at vaccination rates, you look at um, male and female survival rates, you look at those kinds of population-based measures, and we are not getting a lot of value for spending 50% more than any other country in the world. So, what are some of the fundamental problems? What are some of the fundamental misunderstandings that we as individuals, that we as taxpayers, that we as people who pay for insurance, that $13,000 per employee here at Dartmouth College, $13,000 per employee per year. So um, I thought I would begin at a very fundamental level. I don't think we want to get down into the weeds too much here. Um, but just ask you the question, is healthcare a good thing? Or let me say, healthcare is a good thing. No question mark there, sorry. Healthcare is a good thing. How many say true? How many say false? If I give you another choice, how many would, how many would prefer this? Okay. Now, a lot of hands that went up for true did not switch over to it depends. The majority of people in this room, healthcare is a good thing, true. Let me give you a couple of clues as to why I think you might want to reconsider, it depends. Okay? If I were able to guarantee, think about yourself, I'm talking to all of you, if I were able to guarantee you that tomorrow at noon, you would be at the absolute top of your game, physically, intellectually, cognitively, emotionally, spiritually, absolutely top of your game, never been better, with or without 10 hours in the DHMC emergency room overnight, being poked and prodded in uncomfortable ways by strangers, which would you choose, with or without? Okay? And if it were my sad but solemn responsibility to tell each of you that either you or a loved one would not be with us in 30 days, which would you choose? 30 days in an intensive care unit that made the poking and prodding in the emergency room look like child's play? Or maybe dealing with a bucket list for a few weeks and then peace at the last with loved ones? Okay. So the point here is that healthcare is what an economist would call an instrumental good. It's good if it sustains or produces health. It's good if it makes you feel better. If it doesn't, it's at most an inconvenience. 
Now, in making this point, this is a fundamental point in order for societies to wrestle with and solve the problems of healthcare. In order to make the point in such an extreme way, top of your game, guarantee it. Sorry, you're going to die in 30 days. I've cheated in two ways. First, I pretended I have a crystal ball. But you know what? Life is uncertain, and there's nothing more uncertain in life than our prospects for future health. We don't like to acknowledge that. It makes us feel vulnerable, but it's the truth. I've pretended that I had a crystal ball and I could guarantee you something at noon tomorrow, or that I was certain that life would end in 30 days. I don't have a crystal ball. No doctor has a crystal ball. I cheated in another way. I chose absolute extremes, top of your game, physically, intellectually, cognitively, emotionally, spiritually, top of your game on the one hand, or dead on the other. You all recognize there are a lot of gradations along a lot of domains, physical function, social function, emotional, all of those domains, different gradations. And often when you're confronted with a healthcare decision, there are trade-offs to be made. You can't optimize everything. And people disagree, strongly disagree, about what trade-offs are worth making. So, healthcare is complex. And I'm using the term complex in the colloquial sense, the way we all understand it in day-to-day -day life. I'm also using it in the sense of the technical term as organizational theorists describe complexity. What they say is that when you're dealing with a lot of uncertainty, it's awfully hard to get people to move in the same direction. If we're talking about doing intervention A to improve an individual's health or a population's health, if there's a great deal of uncertainty whether or not we achieve our goal with the intervention, it's very hard to get people to make the sacrifices to work together in order to accomplish the intervention. If there's very little uncertainty, it's easier. If there's very little disagreement about how good or bad the goal is, it's a lot easier to get people to work together to make the intervention happen. If there's a great deal of disagreement about how good or bad the goal is, it's a good bit more difficult. So when uncertainty is low and disagreement is low, life is simple. Engineers and architects in the room, forgive me, but you can think like an architect or an engineer. You can draw out exactly what you want to see happen at points in time. And you can determine who should be doing that from the team, given the level of skills necessary. And you can tell people what to do. And by and large, they'll be pulling on the oars together at the right time. If there's great uncertainty and great disagreement about the trade-offs that are worth making, things become pretty chaotic. The only way I could get you all to work together and sacrifice to put this intervention together, make it happen under those circumstances, is if I have a very big stick. It's command and control world. Most of life is in this zone of complexity. Much of what we much of what we do in our thinking about healthcare at the superficial level is deny the complexity. We do our darndest to pretend that the uncertainty isn't there. We do our darndest to pretend that there isn't a lot of disagreement. Policymakers, professionals, doctors and others, and patients and citizens all have different reasons to desperately want to believe the science done over there, perhaps done down at NIH, perhaps done out at the new Life Sciences Building. Science, mediated by the trustworthy people that you remember getting through organic chemistry and beyond, gives you the right answer well executed. The evidence to the contrary is extraordinary. And yet everybody wants to hold on to that belief. We can talk in the discussion about why that might be. So you can see what I was trying to do with this group. And at this point, and I'm going <clears> to, <throat> again, this metaphor I, I'm going to attribute to Dan Lee. I've used it several times since, and it works, works quite well. At this point, I said, I bet many of you have heard of the 
fog of war. How many of you heard of the fog of war? Okay. What's meant by the fog of war? It's a situation where there's a great deal of urgency, lives are at stake, uh, maybe future generations' freedom is at stake, and there's uncertainty about what the right thing to do is. Not only is there uncertainty, but there's ambiguity about the proximate goals and the relationship between the proximate goals and the long-term goals. And there's this urgency. The other thing about the fog of war is that it's a phrase that is usually used when? Not when things are going well, but when things are not going very well. I would argue that we have a fog of healthcare. And that fog of healthcare relates to the complexity that we've just been talking about. Now, another Dartmouth story. This is about my colleague, Jack Wenberg, who has uh, been here um, since the late uh, 1970s. Um, he graduated from Johns Hopkins University as a resident, um, having studied some epidemiology there, and, tra and traveled to uh, Burlington, Vermont um, in the late 1960s. And while at Burlington, um, he decided that he was going to use administrative databases to study the epidemiology, not of disease, which is what we usually think of in terms of epidemiology or looking at the epidemiology of an infectious disease, where did it occur, um, with, with what frequency in which populations, et cetera. What are the factors that seem to be associated with it? No, he wasn't interested in that. He was interested in the epidemiology of healthcare. He said to himself, if I can divide northern New England, starting in Vermont, into hospital market areas, and look at the incidence of different interventions, the frequency of office visits, the frequency of hospital admissions, the frequency of intensive care unit admissions, the frequency of surgery of different kinds. I bet I can show that those people in the Northern Kingdom aren't getting enough health care, and then we can do something about that. Okay. What he found instead, to his great surprise, was that people in the Northern Kingdom got to see primary care doctors just as often as people in the rest of Vermont. And regardless of where you lived in Vermont, you were subject to enormous variation in the kind of care that was delivered. Women in some hospital market areas were six times more likely than those in others to have a hysterectomy by the time they reached menopause. <clears throat> Tonsillectomy rates among school children varied more than 17-fold in different hospital market areas. Prostatectomy rates for benign disease, again, six-fold variation. Think about what this means from the point of view of an individual. Think about yourself. Let me, as an aside, tell you that this same variation persists to this day. So what that does mean for you as an individual is that the care you receive can depend more on where you live and who you see to get that care than who you are and what you care about. So, the fog of healthcare. How can we find our way out of it? First of all, let me give you a sense of the extraordinary national and international implications of this fog of healthcare, this denial of complexity, this unwillingness to face the uncertainty on the one hand and to acknowledge the disagreement. Back surgery happens twice as often on the west coast of the United States than on the east coast. People who have back surgery on the west coast of the United States are seven times more likely to have a device implanted to diffuse the vertebrae than if you live on the east coast. Men who live in Seattle are six times more likely to have a radical prostatectomy for prostate cancer than men who live in Connecticut. Follow 20 years, Medicare cohort. You think there's any difference in prostate cancer mortality? So this variation phenomenon is extraordinary from this point of view of the care you get depends more on where you live and who you see than who you are and what you care about. But it also has extraordinary economic implications. Per capita Medicare costs in this day and age in Miami are about $16,000 per person. They're about five or $6,000 in Minneapolis. Per capita Medicare costs in a town called McAllen, Texas are about 15,000. McAllen got singled out not because they had the highest rate, Miami is higher, 
but because they had the highest growth rate over the past decade, just 400 miles up the border in El Paso. Very similar demographics, about half the per capita costs. That story about McAllen and the comparison to El Paso was written about in June of 2010 by Atul Gawande. If you haven't read the article, I commend it to you. It had an enormous impact on the president. As the story goes, he gets the New Yorker, it's at his bedside. He, he read it one night. Um, this came out on June 1st. Uh, on June 3rd, he walked down and threw that magazine down on the cabinet room table and said, this is the problem we've got to fix. That was reported in an editorial um, in the Times in, on June 16th. I'll show you that later if we get into this in the discussion. So how do we find our way out of this fog? I'm going to suggest that we need to set some simple rules. The people who study complexity and its impact on organizations or groups of people, societies, um, trying to find their way out of the complexity, argue that if you over-specify, if you try and tell people what to do, when they're dealing with different reactions among themselves to the level of uncertainty, when they're willing to make different trade-offs or not willing to make different trade-offs, you know, again, if we, if, we, if we made this a workshop and we went around and talked about what you're willing to trade off in terms of length of life, quality of life, um, what men are willing to trade off in terms of urinary function, sexual function, how women in the room who e have either had breast cancer or imagine what it would be like feel about the prospect of living without a breast as opposed to the prospect of having cancer come back in a breast that they chose to keep. Right? All of those things require trade-offs and those decisions about trade-offs are all made in the face of uncertainty. That kind of complexity means that you can't say breast conserving surgery is the new modern way in which we deliver breast cancer treatment because you're going to be giving breast conserving surgery to many women who would prefer a mastectomy. You can't say that we have this new intervention that sure it compromises your sexual function a little bit, but it dramatically improves your urinary function if you're in your 60s or 70s. Because some men simply would not want to make that trade-off. If you don't recognize the individual uniqueness of the people who live with the consequences of healthcare, you inevitably do what? You give interventions to people who wouldn't choose them while you withhold them from people who would. So what the complexity theorists say is don't over-specify. If you do and you're trying to lead an organization, you're going to have all kinds of sabotage, all kinds of end runs. You ever seen that in an organization where complexity is an honor? And if you do it at the individual level, you're going to give interventions to people who wouldn't choose them while you withhold them from people who would. So what you do instead is you try and create some simple rules. And I'm, I'm trying to codify some simple rules for healthcare going forward. There are three buckets from which you choose the simple rules. One is direction setting, leadership. One is boundaries. Here's what we don't allow to happen. And the third is what do we care so much about that we're going to do our best to measure it so that we can reward it. Okay. So my candidate for a simple rule in healthcare for direction setting is the whole goal is to give people the care they need and no less and the care they want and no more. You know, if you put your patient hat on for a moment, even if you have to work hard to imagine that because you've been blessed with good health, or if you put your citizen hat on, um, does anyone want to argue with that? That's the goal of healthcare system. Care each individual needs and no less, wants and no more. Okay. I can argue with that, but I'll wait until it's question time. Okay. Uh, no decision about health and healthcare should be made in the face of avoidable ignorance. You want to argue with that one? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> uh, here's the point here. Now, I'm, I'm at, you know, these are some of the most fateful decisions that people make. You know, whether it's how to treat your heart disease, whether it's how to treat your breast cancer, your prostate cancer, whether it's how to treat the autism, whether it's how to, these are the most fateful decisions that people make. And if there are all of these trade-offs, 
don't you want to be sure that at least the dyad, the doctor and the patient together between them, are avoiding the ignorance that can be avoided? And that's another way of saying, look, uncertainty is inevitable. There's collective professional uncertainty when we haven't had the discipline, the research, I'm sorry, the discipline, the time, the resources to do the necessary research to know what the probabilities of different outcomes are with different interventions. Nobody knows. Now that's not great and we ought to continue to spend more on the kind of research that gives us those probabilities and perhaps less on the Hail Mary research that, that we do at the basic science level. But collective uncertainty is a re reality. But even when we've done the research, it might be interpreted very differently by different doctors. Maybe they weren't paying as much attention as they should have in the finite math course that John Kennedy was teaching, if they were lucky enough to have it. They don't understand Bayes' theorem. They don't understand. So they can't deal with these quantitative relationships any better than their patients can. And their patients never had John Kennedy's finite math course. So under those circumstances, somebody knows, but the interpretation hasn't been made right in the context of this particular patient, and it hasn't been delivered just in time when the decision is being made. That's what I mean by avoidable ignorance. If you think for a moment of the aspects of healthcare that make it the quintessential knowledge industry, think how little we've invested to manage the knowledge to be sure that no decision is made in the face of avoidable ignorance. And then every decision about health and healthcare should be informed by both professional knowledge and personal knowledge. You can see where I'm coming from here, right? Go back to that fog of healthcare, all about the complexity. Uncertainty is addressed by doing the research, managing the knowledge, and it's our goal to reduce the uncertainty as much as possible as professionals, and then share the knowledge with patients and communities about what can be done and what can't be done, what we know, what we don't know. But it's not our job as professionals to reduce the disagreement regarding the trade-offs that people are to make. Nobody wants to be treated just like their neighbor. Everybody feels that they're unique with regard to these personal matters and context and what gives meaning to life for individuals. So the professional knowledge has to meet the personal knowledge in order to make the right decision. And here's the, here's the really interesting leap, and this, this, is, one of the, um, this is one of the most fun um, arguments to make uh, because it strikes right at the heart of the partisan politics that keep us from making real progress in healthcare. What would Adam Smith do if he were charged with fixing healthcare? What would Karl Marx do if he were charged with fixing healthcare? Karl Marx would say, well, you know, this capacity problem that you're talking about, primary, secondary, tertiary care, pediatrics, geriatrics, intensive care, surgery, mental health, et cetera, you know, we would just have some people plan and we would look at the best possible epidemiologic data about the diseases and we would develop a planned economy where we can control the capacity to do those different things so that we could come as close as possible at a baseline level in giving people the care they need no less and want no more. I might say to Carl, Carl, that's a pretty good way of controlling capacity, but I don't think you're nearly there in terms of personalizing care and being sure you're not giving interventions to people who wouldn't choose them while you're withholding from people who would. Now what Adam Smith might say is, you know, this is all about giving people choices, but you have to have perfect information. If you have the perfect information and people have choices, the choices they make reveal their preferences. And that sends signals to those who invest and disinvest in building capacity in order to have a healthcare system that meets the wants and needs of individuals. Does that contrast with what you're hearing from our politicians now? There's no right answer to solving this capacity personalization, personal care conundrum without drawing from the strengths of planning at a common pool resource level and personalization, recognizing how markets fail and confronting the market failure head on. So, leading us out of the fog, the care you need no less, want no more, 
and we'll talk about that. No decision about health and health care made in the face of avoidable ignorance. Every decision about health and health care should be informed by both professional knowledge and personal knowledge. Patients must shape the capacity of the health care system by revealing their preferences. Does that sound scary to any of you? Well, I'm going to say that it's not the habit for any of you. <laughs> that you need more curiosity. You need to say more often, how do I know this recommendation is right for me, personally? You need more confidence. How do I understand this choice in the context of my values and preferences? And you need courage to accept the personal responsibility for decisions that will determine, not determine, but certainly influence your healthcare future. Now, this was when I sort of jogged over into a bit of an advertisement for the new Dartmouth Center for Healthcare Delivery Science. Uh, so I'll go through this very quickly. The argument was healthcare is so complex that the problems won't be solved, they can't even be addressed without bringing together the very best thinkers from across disciplines. Not only people from medicine and public health and economics and sociology and anthropology and management sciences, et cetera, but the arts and sciences as well, the humanities even. You know, we're talking about personal agency. You know, when you start talking about courage and making choices, et cetera, there's an awful lot to learn from the humanities when you're trying to go deep that way. So best thinkers from across disciplines, but this is not an academic exercise that we're engaged in here at Dartmouth. We need to have those best thinkers from across disciplines intentionally, iteratively over time, connected with the very best doers across contexts. We'll talk about how we've been trying to achieve that um, at the center. The reason across context is so important is you get some great ideas from the best thinkers across disciplines and you work really hard on innovation and implementation, and some will succeed wonderfully in some contexts and fail in other contexts. If you don't test them in an adequate number of contexts, you're gonna throw away a lot of really good ideas, right? So you need a network, you need colleagues, you need people who come from different cultures, different levels of resources, different ways of organizing care uh, in order to advance the science as quickly as possible. And because some of the things we've been talking about relate to primal fears, and we can talk about what I mean by that, what else would explain the resistance, right? Crossing the Quality Chasm was published 15 years ago. To Air as Human was published before that. The data indicating that science mediated by trustworthy individuals gives you the right answer, well executed. The data to, to give lie to that assumption is extraordinary rich, rich and, and, and convincing. And yet, we still want to hold on to it. So there's something primal going on there. You need best communicators from across constituencies and media to change hearts and minds. So again, here's the part of the promo that I was doing at the time. Basic science, we spend about $70 billion a year between government and industry in the United States alone on basic science research. It used to be about what is the pathophysiology, now it's more about what are the cells and what are the structures and what are the systems within the cells and what are the molecules. We spend far less than that on clinical science. What is the diagnosis and appropriate intervention? The evaluative clinical sciences began in the 70s and 80s. The Center for the Evaluative Clinical Sciences, first in the country, was established here in 1989 by Jack Weinberg and colleagues. What we're saying is that we need a new science, and that's the science of healthcare delivery. How do we best deliver the event intervention to those who value it? I'm going to close this part before I start with my pseudo chalk and get your reactions with a story. Jack Winberg wasn't the first person to discover the phenomenon of practice variation. J. Allison Glover was a surgeon son of a surgeon, actually son of a GP, um, in uh, England, uh, fought in the Boer War. Um, he was uh, uh, enough of an epidemiologist to save many lives at the front in World War I with some advances in uh, medical care for people um, injured on the front. Um, in his later years, he was responsible for all of the health issues in school districts across England and Wales and he applied his epidemiology 
studying in great detail the incidence of tonsillectomy across all of England and Wales. He found a whole bunch of interesting things. That, um, there was a jump up at age five in the rate of tonsillectomy. What do you think that was due to? Kids going off to school or being exposed to new bacteria, right? And then there was another jump up at age 12 for girls, 13 for boys. Hmm, he said, I wonder what's going on at puberty that would make the tonsils look bigger or make people more susceptible to infection. But he too found enormous variation geographically in rates. Tenfold variation in the rates of tonsillectomy in different school districts. In 1938, he read a paper on the corner of Wimpole Street and Henrietta Place. And for those of you who know London, it's just a block north and two blocks west of Oxford Circus. And in that paper, he referred to the strange bare facts of incidence. And he talked about this tenfold variation in the rates of tonsillectomy. And he described how he worked really hard to estimate the risk of death associated with the surgical treatment of tonsillectomy as opposed to medical treatment of tonsillectomy. And he thought it was at least eightfold greater. Tenfold greater risk of exposure to tonsillectomy conferring an eightfold greater risk of death. The care these kids received depended more on where they lived and who they saw than who they were or what they or their parents cared about. After he read this paper, the president of the, uh, uh, the representative of the Medical Research Council of England, again, 1938, said this seems to be an operation done for no particular reason and no particular result. The president of the Royal Society of Medicine then said, yes, and isn't it a shame that so many children died anesthetic deaths for a procedure of doubtful benefit? Nothing happened. The in-country variation in tonsillectomy rates, the inter-country variation in tonsillectomy date rates continued for decades and persist to this day. What if the parent had said, how do you know this is right for my child? What if you all say the next time a recommendation is made? How do you know this is right for me? So that was the end of my my uh, TEDx talk. As I said, if you're interested in the reaction, um, all you get there is, is applause or none. <laughs> so, and, uh, and that's why I'm so anxious to get your reactions and talk a little bit more about the future of healthcare delivery science at, uh, at Dartmouth.